So, good morning, everyone. I uh, would like to welcome you all to this second day uh, of the Italian Forum. Uh, this morning, we are delighted to have as our keynote speaker, uh, Professor Mario Tello, uh, who has just arrived from Brussels. Uh, he's a member of the Royal Academy of Sciences, he's an emeritus professor, uh, both of the European Institutes uh, in Brussels and uh, Louis University. Uh, he's probably one of the most uh, important experts both on uh, European politics and uh, uh, EU policy in, uh, in general. So we are extremely delighted to have you here and uh, I yield the floor to you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm a professor of international relations and uh, the question you addressed is particularly crucial for uh, uh, the development of Italy within the context of a controversial globalization, competitive globalization, and the context of an unstable international order in the, in the making. Well, let's, I would like to, to present you uh, two collective research we have uh, conducted in uh, Brussels, particularly, and in Rome during the last 10 years about these topics. And uh, I, I have this provocative title, what about uh, any alternative, exist any alternative to the European approach to foreign policy, which is typical of Italy in our understanding. Well, Let's try saying that uh, Italy, the, everybody knows, but I would like to stress that uh, we are talking about uh, a relevant country, member of the G7 and G20, G7 since the very beginning. And uh, uh, we also can say that uh, it, northern Italy belongs to the blue banana in uh, sociological and economic terms, uh, from London to Milano Bologna, this area which is one of the richest in the world. Uh, and the third point uh, to be mentioned uh, is that Italy is the third largest uh, economy in the Eurozone and uh, second manufacturing industry country surviving in spite of the economic crisis thanks to 4,000 4, middle-sized companies. Is, according to Castronovo survey, in spite of the international crisis. However, the public debt is 133 of GDP, and 2015 is true, it's true, Prime Minister emphasizes this posit positive point, the growth is 0.1, but after three years of economic recession, which is uh, quite uh, problematic. So this is a, is a very simple, easy starting point, what we are talking about. Uh, well, in, in our research, uh, we started in Oxford uh, by a book, which I have a copy here in case someone or you is interested, these uh, European stories. This is, is a research conducted by Nicolaidis, director of the European Institute in Oxford. And uh, in uh, this research, the main thesis is uh, that the Italian typical approach to the globalization through the lenses of the European Union is uh, particularly based on continuity, rather than on discontinuity. And I would like to bring argument in favor of this thesis which means that uh, uh, 45 is still the relevant critical historical juncture, changing the approach of Italy to globalization and foreign affairs. All the decision in foreign policy and external relations should be understood as a path dependency after 45. The Gasperi took the essential decision after the war between uh, 45 and uh, 54 is dead and Italy started to be one of the founder of the European community as you know nothing of the Italian history after 45 can be understood out of this past dependency 
democratic consolidation, in spite of so many problems, terrorism and so on, socioeconomic growth, relations with near and far abroad. This is a, is a general hypothesis we have, uh, uh, we have deepened in our collective research. Well, when re by rethinking to Italy at global level, I would like to bring the, the findings of this research and conclude by some actual reference to Eurobarometer and the ISPI research. ISPI is a research center in Milano. Well, this book uh, I mentioned before, this one, European Stories, is particularly relevant in case you are interested. It's published by Oxford University Press because it draws the attention on the long durée. The long durée is an explanation of this particular Italian approach. We are, we are now 750 years after the Dante Alighieri approach. Let's mention without any rhetorics that this legacy as a cultural nation, as a cultural nation, uh, is a, a nation where, where uh, the founder of the Italian language was in his uh, soul European. And this uh, cultural approach to Europe has been revived in, during the last 50 years by all relevant Italian intellectuals. That is, is important because each one by its own way, uh, from uh, hard science to, to human humanities, uh, like uh, Magris and Deco, all are in favor of European unity and European approach. It's, it's impressive. You, have, you don't find something like that in France or uh, in UK or in Germany even if Germany is more comparable than other countries to Italy, particularly for the second element, the, the tragic failure of fascist nationalism. This was the true alternative, the nationalist alternative. Contrary to the UK, Italy has not a strong democratic nationalism tradition, and the, the nationalist approach was uh, uh, defeated and was particularly tragic for Italy and the consequences of WW2 were particularly relevant because Europe, in the, in the collective memory of many Italians, is an anti-fascist anti idea. And uh, uh, someone could say that even three days ago, uh, the Casa Pound demonstration in, against Europe confirms this uh, strong uh, uh, anti-fascist nature of the idea of Europe. And Altiero Spinelli is the symbol of this. That, uh, you know, the building of the European Parliament in Brussels, name is Altiero Spinelli building, is a symbol of the Italian approach to the European Union. What Italy has, has let me say, contributed to the European construction is this uh, particular approach in the, in the collective memory of the Europeans is the Altiero Spinelli building. Altiero Spinelli is a symbol of this uh, link between anti-fascist tradition and the Europe, uh, idea of Europe. Well, the idea of Europe, not only thanks to Spinelli, but to many grounding father, was uh, for 50 years a centripetal issue. What I mean by centripetal issues there are maybe many experts maybe of comparative politics here. We have had uh, the, the, the issue of uh, uh, building Europe, constructing Europe was uh, a cleavage between 45 and the 60s, between left and right. And particularly the Catholic and liberal were in favor, where the left was against. Uh, and the, the, ch the dramatic change occurred uh, in the 60s and 70s where you have a kind of, of a constitutional parties consensus about deepening European construction, federal approach to European construction. This is impressive. And the top of this process was uh, the referendum in 89 which is really the conclusion of this process started in 45, where 89% of the Italians voted in favor of providing the European Parliament with constitutional powers. It's impressive, absolutely impressive. It was the, the, 
the, the, the most relevant success of this Pinelli approach to the European construction. It's very impressive because, because you have Catholic liberals, left-wing parties, all supporting, yes, to this very, very radical approach to the European construction, a federal state approach, which is, a, to some extent, utopian, huh? let me say. <laughs> but the Italians voted by 89% in favor, uh, by referendum. That is uh, absolutely Im impressive. In spite of the initial cleavage in the period of 45, 60, uh, that is very, very, of course, the left also evolving in this direction, thanks to people like Giorgio Napolitano and so on. This, they played a particular relevant role. Well, I'm going back here. <laughs> uh, what about the relevance of this uh, long durée as the Second Republic is concerned? Because we have had two Eurosceptical wave. The first uh, strong Eurosceptical wave is the Second Republic. W would the, the, the idea of changing the approach of Italy to European and to global affairs, following to some extent the Margaret Thatcher path, which became popular between 94 and 97 particularly. So, in my opinion, in spite of this uh, attempt to create a kind of break, I remember uh, Foreign Minister Martino came to Brussels and Bruges and gave a very important speech, because Martino is a relevant intellectual, uh, coming from Sicily, from son of the famous Martino of the Messina Messina Conference 55, was Minister of Foreign Affairs, said, we are against the euro, the common currency, and we want to be, to follow the British path, as the European Union is concerned. So it was particularly relevant, as, because never before so relevant authorities like Prime Minister, Foreign Minister, take pos took position in this, in this uh, direction. So the question is why this uh, first very important, uh, the very important, uh, let me say, wave of Euroscepticism and uh, the look for an alternative failed. Look at the presidency of Berlusconi, the next one, in 2003, where he became absolutely loyal to the European Union. So it's impressive, the, this uh, dramatic change where uh, the, this uh, alternative uh, was totally missed because it doesn't exist. The reason is uh, Euro by necessity. Something like that happened in Germany. We had a wave of Eurosceptical wave in the same years, uh, affecting the Christian Democratic Party and the Liberal Party, and they came back to also the same idea, Euro and Europe by necessity. Yeah? Because, because there is... L is no alternative exists. What about the second wave, the one we are living now? New general Eurosceptical wave in the European Union, and what about the distinctive Italian features? Well, the second wave, contrary to the first, is really general. We are in the country where the UKIP is rem remembering every day its influence also in the conservative party area, electorate. Well, in, the, in 2014, the European Parliament election did show a very relevant wave, because 18% of the current European Parliament members are, can be classified as Eurosceptical. However, they are very split and fragmented, notably between uh, ultra-liberal and protectionist. The Italian are rather protectionist, uh, the Italian Eurosceptical Party. They, are, they, have, they share two enemies, European Union and the immigrants. But on the other issues, they are quite split. They are unable to create a common uh, parliamentary group in the European Parliament. Uh, someone looks for a European Union exit, like you keep. Someone is uh, satisfied, would be satisfied with Euro exit, like uh, the Italians. 
Well, what do the Italian Eurosceptical stream propose as alternative for an out of Euro Italian approach to the globalized world, the topics of your conference? Huh? What about the alternative? Well, let's uh, talk about two main parties, the Northern League and the Five Stars Movement. Huh? Uh, you know very well, so I don't need to take, uh, to, to, to spend time about that. Uh, they are knowing quite a successful trend. Uh, as you know, the Northern League is growing up from 3% to 13, 14 in the Gallup. Uh, five stars is declining from 25 to 18 now in the Gallup. And uh, what they are, the, what, what they are, uh, let me say, channeling is uh, f uh, feelings as the globalization is concerned. Strange, uh, strange uh, and uh, very strong rhetoric anti-euro, which is considered as a foreign cur currency, quite comic because uh, the president of the European Central Bank is an Italian. So uh, what, what should be said uh, after the Draghi, or before the Draghi presidency, nobody knows. Uh, second, anti-free trade feelings, very strong. Protectionist demand regarding trade. For instance, there is a campaign against TTIP. Huh? Less than in France, but strong enough. We could talk about that. And anti-Schengen Treaty demands. Tre Schengen Treaty is considered as guilty of allowing invasion of illegal immigrants, opposed to provide Italian citizens. That is uh, remarkable also for Grillo. Grillo opposed the recognition of Italian citizenship to some of uh, the young babies of immigrants, even if born on the Italian soil. So we have a second research on this uh, second wave, which has been published by Comparative European Politics in May 2013, this, uh, this uh, uh, journal. So, Dramatic change, however, never we had such a strong anti-European wave as an alternative understanding of the Italian role in the world. What they propose concretely about their challenging, uh, let me say, the establishment is the fears of immigrant invasion and feeling of Italian marginalization within a Nordic and German European Union. But uh, I have looked into the papers and there is uh, no alternative foreign policy with two exceptions, maybe. Number one, eastward, there is an approach favoring Putin, particularly Northern League, very strong, uh, as in the past, we have some signs when they favored Milosevic during the 99 war against uh, Serbia. Uh, so favoring Putin and understanding Putin's argument uh, play in favor of alliance with Putin against the Islam. And southward, we have on the one hand uh, Arab policy of uh, Euro European fortress, Italian fortress, on the other end, uh, in a uh, Five Stars movement, a kind of pacifist approach to ISIS, huh? against any commitment, any international missions, any coalition against ISIS, in favor of a peaceful dialogue, question mark. Uh, there I, I see a fundamental difference between Italy and the UK. Uh, do Italians want more or less European Union? Because uh, here it's clear that not only uh, the UK, but, uh, but Cameron are in favor of what is called a more flexible European Union, means less European Union, renationalization of policies. Where, look at uh, th this point of view, look at the Eurobarometer. This is a survey I would like to mention because it's quite relevant and it's very recent. The, the Italians are in, uh, unhappy with, with the degree of democracy within the European Union, in spite of the growth of the pa power of the European Parliament. It's not enough. 
Habermas already said that the European Parliament is not enough to cope with the feeling of, uh, of democratic deficit. So is that, that is a real problem. Uh, second, Italians are more in favor of a kind of fortress toward immigrant uh, migratory flows than, all, than, the, than the, the, the average. You see here, uh, sorry, uh, here. I looking for the, look at the, at the Italy, you see the positive, the, the, which they are in favor of immigrants are less than the, the European average, less than the Germans, even less than the, the, the British. And I know that there is a kind of anti-immigrant atmosphere in this country. So this is relevant, and this gives you the, the an idea of the relevance of the pos the chance of this possible anti-immigrant campaign. However, on the other end, and that is crucial. The crucial difference with the UK, and the crucial difference with the UK, I would like to underline, in spite of doubts and criticism, the main challenges regarding Italy's Italy within a globalized and uncertain world are bringing Italians to call for a stronger and deeper European integration. That is impressive. Uh, I will show you that regarding economic recovery, energy union, trade arrangement with external partners, euro as a common currency, cooperative trust in institutions, Italians are more in favor of deepening the European Union. That is uh, very impressive because this happens in the context of a, let me say, second wave of Eurosceptical trends. I'm quite quick in that. So look at the public money and growth policy, you see the, the, the who are in favor are uh, much more the Italians than uh, the British, of course, and even more than the French. Huh? That is uh, the, regarding the, the promise of, uh, uh, of a Juncker plan for investment. Uh, is uh, way out of the case. Second, the euro is a common currency. Italians are by 54% in favor. However, the against the is, uh, is growing up to 32. Uh, the European Energy Union in Italy, there is a very strong support, and that is relevant. Relevant for the relationship with Russia, relevant with the relationship with, with the Arab world. So the, 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 the preference of the Italians is rather in favor of a European approach than a national approach. That is a very interesting. The TTIP, you know, TTIP is splitting, splitting the Germans. Look at the Germans. Huh? Uh, look at the Italians. I don't know whether you have had the, the, the time to read the Confindustria <coughs> paper on TTIP. Absolutely in favor. We had a meeting here at the House of Lords, here, we, in our, our research project, Green, organized the meeting at the House of Lords, and the many members of the House of Lords said, ah, it's tr the traditional Southern European protectionist approach. It's not true, not at all. Look, the Italians are much more in favor the, of the TTIP than the, other, <laughs> the, other, uh, than the Germans and the French. That is uh, impressive, but it's true. Uh, this uh, uh, TTIP is not an Italian uh, idea, it's an European approach, uh, particularly a Merkel idea, I have to say. In spite of the German doubt, the German doubt is because of the spy story, as you know. Uh, and, and the National Security Agency spying uh, Merkel uh, mobile phone, <laughs> and so, uh, which was is considered as a scandal in Germany. Let's look at the Trust in, in institutions. Well, the trust in European institutions is declining compared with the 80s and 90s. However, it's still remarkably superior to the national institution, to the Italian government. You see, the Italian government is the last one. Yeah. Uh, so the Italian government is the last one, whereas you have the European Commission and the, in the European Parliament in the middle. Huh? Up the police. 
Well, uh, finally, second record, uh, second survey I would like to mention, then I will stop, is about the Italian foreign policy. It's been organized by ISPI, it's been published a week, two weeks ago. I was part of this uh, survey. What about the, the main threat for Italy? The economic crisis, the main threat. See? Uh, diffusion of, of uh, populism uh, is the second one. Lib Libya crisis is the second one, third one, we can say. Then the crisis with Russia, the fourth one, Islamic terrorism, uh, the fifth one. Immigration comes later, which is uh, quite strange. And possible problems in energy provision. Look, uh, well, that is interesting because uh, by giving a detailed assessment, evaluation of the Italian foreign policy, Italian foreign policy, the experts which has been asked for this survey answer that they are particularly disappointed by the capacity of Italy of attracting foreign direct invest investments, uh, particularly disappointed, but they are and by the relation with India, you know the, the reason why, eh? the Maro, the Marines story. And uh, they're quite happy with the relation, comparatively happy with the relation with the United States, and less about the presence of Italy in Europe in spite of the Italian presidency. So my conclusion is on foreign policy is that uh, Italians need the European External Action Service more than other great European countries. Uh, this is also my conclusion. Lutz, uh, the Italians are not very interested in foreign policy. They don't take care of foreign policy, like the British or the French. Uh, we see, you see that we spend 1% of GDP for defense and 022 for foreign policy, which means uh, that the cuts were necessary uh, down to 900 diplomats, compared with 4,000 in the UK, and three, I would say 3,500 in the European External Action Service, which can be maybe one of your future uh, career opportunities. Italian people are not aware enough that essential goods like economic growth, foreign trade, energy provision, migration, organization of Mediterranean, depend on foreign policy. That is true. It has been denounced even recently by the former Italian foreign minister Bonino. Uh, conclusion about Italy's approach to globalization, in my eyes, is that is a further reason why you, European Union foreign policy and the US are particularly needed as an essential complementary factor for a two-week national foreign policy. So Italy needs the European foreign policy, not as a replacement, but as a complementary level, more than France, UK, and Germany. Uh, that is particularly relevant, also for your possible future career. Looks at the Italian rotating presidency declaration, Italy strongly support the European External Action Service in the effort to strengthen the European Union posture in the international stage. So that is very important because it confirms the, my idea of continuity. I'm concluding about continuity and, and discontinuity. I'm coming, I'm teaching uh, since uh, three years also at Lewis. The founder of Lewis was Guido Carli. I remember the name of Lewis is Guido Carli. Well, Guido Carli in 71 said, what is Europe for Italy? Is a powerful constraining factor boosting Italian modernization. This is the, was the main idea. Well. Matteo Renzi, 2014, again, Italian presidency is a unique opportunity to rediscover the real soul of Europe in the sense of our life together. Well, conclude, I conclude, however, by a question, which can be maybe discussed with you. No fundamental political change is likely to happen in the forthcoming years. In Italy, there is no link between the, the current Eurosceptical wave, which is relevant and new, and the government level. There is no link between both. Contrary to the UK, where the Eurosceptical trend has a link with the promise of the government, uh, Cameron government, to uh, have a Brexit, Brexit referendum in 2016. 
and the consequent revived great power rhetorics, inevitably. No serious alternative to European Union focused approach exists so far in Italy. And that is uh, my conclusion. However, the question is whether this uh, uh, Italian approach, which is a strong continuity with what has been done by the elites uh, since 1945, is appropriated for a global scenario of a dramatic change in geopolitics, where, for instance, uh, Gionel said maybe by 2000. 20, it's not uh, 15, 2025 in his quotation. Sorry for this small mistake. He said, Italy could be out of the G7 because replaced by Indonesia, Mexico, and so on. This uh, is uh, in terms of uh, international ranking. So big uh, geopolitical and geoeconomic change is the Italian approach appropriated for that. In my opinion, it is only provided that the Italians are able, by governmental policies, by mobilization of civil society, to cope with the structural weakness, structural weakness, which are the reliability as a national system, domestic reforms, addressing the implementation gap as European Union directives, European Union structural fund, European Union modernization policies, more innovation, more efficiency, more effectiveness in public policies, more professional behavior within the European policy making and diplomatic activity. That is, in a journalistic terms, in Brussels, more proactive and more efficient presence of Italy in this context. Just, uh, I think that some of you would uh, maybe ask the question what I think about that. Because I, I presented collective research, I presented surveys, what I think about that. My, my personal feeling, and uh, Gunnar Myrdal, the prime Nobel Prize for Economy I met, uh, always invites every speaker to, to declare his values. Uh, not only to present objective research, but to openly declare its value. Well, I think that this Italian continuity is a good thing, <laughs> I have to say. It's a good thing because, you know, it should be, we sh as Italians, we should be proud about that. And the, 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 the non-Italians should respect it. Because, uh, you know, the idea of uh, strengthening supranational institutions is the maybe one of the most appealing and great ideas produced at the end of the 20th century after so many wars. And there is not only the first narrative who justifies this uh, the positive approach, but I think a new narrative. Europe is uh, the only part of the world where globalization is managed in a democratic, social, socially even and peaceful way. And that is a message, a strong message, without to be arrogant, to say we, we want to export the European model in the world. But as understated message, we, can, we are also there in the context where Russia, China, Brazil, India behave in the international scene in another way, to have this kind of approach is a, a European message, a strong European message. So we have to be proud about that. Thank you very much. <laughs>